Okay. I'm speaking from the phys physical space of New York City. I would like to acknowledge the land on which I currently reside, which historically was that of the Ladafe, Kanarisi, Rockaway, and Wappinger indigenous peoples. We deliver a land acknowledgement to acknowledge the historical legacy of colonialism by honoring and paying respect to the land, which was taken by conquest along with the domination of the people who inhibited the land and the imposition of white supremacy. We do it to raise greater public consciousness of native sovereignty and cultural rights as a small step toward equitable relations and relationship and reparation. We encourage the participants on today's call to privately acknowledge the land that sustains and supports you. If you do not already know your area's history, we have provided a link in the chat to learn more about the indigenous peoples that live or lived in your area. If you're new to Hunger Free America, HFA is a nonpartisan national nonprofit building the movement to enact the policies and programs needed to end domestic hunger and ensure that all Americans have sufficient access to nutritious food. We do this through both our direct service and advocacy work, both of which we feel strengthens each other. As an AmeriCorps VISTA leader at HFA, my work centers around supporting VISTA members who are fighting against hunger in their communities across the country. We are sharing a link in the chat to a Google Drive folder that contains resources and information spoken about in this event for your future reference. HFA's work to end hunger is more pressing than ever. According to a report published by HFA in July 2020, the United States is facing the gravest hunger crisis in modern times, with more than one in three children missing meals or suffering from reduced portion sizes because their families don't have enough food, money for food. The rate of child hunger is five times higher than before the pandemic, and adult hunger is 2.5 times higher. As domestic hunger increases, all types of low-income families are suffering, but data shows that people of color are impacted at higher rates. HFA data shows that in the spring and summer of this year, 41.1% of Black respondent households experienced food insecurity, as did 36.9% of Hispanic respondent households, in contrast to 23.2% of white respondent households. As a global pandemic and demands for racial justice collide, it is more important than ever to uplift MLK's message of justice. Over two decades, Hunger Free America has honored Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy by coordinating service events and volunteer actions supporting long-term solutions to hunger. With this year's service on, our hope is that volunteers will learn something new, take action in the fight against hunger, as well as take away some ideas on how to continue working towards and supporting a more equitable community. Okay, so as we begin this workshop, we'd like to introduce some group norms to frame our dialogue. So a safe space is a brave space. We are called to create a brave space where we accept the likelihood that we will be uncomfortable when investigating issues of race, privilege, and oppression, and our roles within them. We work to recognize our priv your privilege. Sorry, work to recognize your privileges. Use this space to recognize and investigate your privileges. For example, class, gender, sexual orientation, ability. Honor the different experiences we all bring to this space. Take risks. Lean into discomfort. We are all in process. Challenge yourself to contribute, even if it is not perfectly formulated. Actively listen. Use your energy to listen to what is said before thinking about how to respond. Notice when defensiveness and denial arise. If anyone has any additional norms, we welcome them in the chat. Okay, so now 
I'd like to introduce our moderator, Daniel Giusti. Growing up in a food-loving Italian family, Dan aspired to attend the Culinary Institute of America in New York, after which he quickly rose to the culinary rank. He served as executive chef of 1789 in Washington, DC, then later moved to Copenhagen to work at Norm Noma. After three years as head chef, he returned to the United States to tackle another culinary challenge, school food. In 2016, he founded Brigade under the premise, the premise of as assembling a team of talented and motivated personal professional staff, sorry, professional staff to apply their culinary expertise to improve the offerings and quality of school food service operations. The initial intention has, sen has since expanded to senior centers and prisons, always guided by Dan's belief that everyone deserves real wholesome food cooked with care and passion. Excellent. Dan, if you want to take it away. I will. Thank you. Thank you, Brennan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for joining us. This is a very important conversation that um, someone who's a chef and someone who's gotten into institutional food uh, later in my career now has um, unfortunately never really heard this conversation about food in prisons. It's a conversation that's not had so often. So just a little bit about myself. Um, so you know who I am as I moderate this, but also as I talk about things and maybe uh, over time you ask questions during this session. Uh, I'm a chef, as Brennan said, the majority of my career was working in restaurants. And in 2016, I started a company called Brigade. Brigade is a company that uh, recruits, trains, and really kind of um, encourages professional chefs who otherwise might not choose the career of institutional food to do so. The majority of our work thus far has been in uh, public grade schools. We started in Connecticut. We've moved to the Bronx. We're now in Richmond, Virginia as well. And we're moving to Denver public schools. Uh, we've now worked in senior centers and we have interest in working in prisons. Uh, we have not worked in prisons. Uh, I have never set foot in a kitchen in a prison. I want to make that clear. Um, the extent of what I know about food in prisons is what's going to be presented to you today. Um, by our by our co-moderators or co-hosts, I guess you should say, from Impact Justice. And that's kind of my relation to the space. Um, we're very interested in getting involved and we're hoping to work together to do just that. Uh, we'll talk more about, I will talk more about later, my ambitions and kind of what we would hope to do as a company. But I just wanted to say that, um, and again, it's just such an important conversation. Uh, I thought school food was something that was kind of neglected to a certain extent, uh, but obviously school food is oftentimes in the news and it's criticized and that criticism pushes the space to be better. Uh, but again, that's not happening uh, with food in prisons. And it's, I think what you'll find today, if you don't know anything about this topic, that it's more than alarming, um, the situation, to be completely honest with you. It's, it's actually unbelievable. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce the folks that are going to, that are the professionals in this space. I'm going to read you their bios and then they're going to take it away. Uh, before I do that, remember there's a chat function. All of you were asked to introduce yourselves, but use the chat function, use the chat function to comment, use the chat function to ask questions, to react. It's nice, uh, when you're having a bit of an engagement. I don't think any of us here wanna talk at you. We wanna have a conversation here. And although we will have time reserved at the end for questions from all of you, some of those questions might be better answered during the duration of the presentation itself and more appropriate at that time. So please use the chat function. There's a few of us on here. We'll all be looking at it the whole time. So um, again, I'm gonna introduce uh, the professionals here. Um, so Mika Weinstein is the program manager at Impact Justice and has managed the Impact Justice Food in Prison project since its inception in the summer of 2018, overseeing the organization's efforts to undertake the first national assessment of prison food. Mika graduated summa cum laude from the University of Oregon in 2014 with a degree in planning, public policy, and management. And then Leslie Sobel joined Impact Justice in the fall of 2018 as a research fellow for the Food in Prison project. An educator and ethnographer, Leslie is the founder and artistic director of Story Soup, a project that creates context for dialogue across cultural and generational borders through food and narrative. 
She has over a decade of experience designing and facilitating cultural competency workshops to explore identities, systems of oppression, and intercultural, intergenerational communication. Leslie holds a BA in gender studies from Brown University and a master's in cultural sustainability from Goucher College. So without further ado, uh, Mika and Leslie. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, I wanna echo what Dan said. We're all really happy to um, have so many folks joining us, interested in learning about this subject. We wanna thank Hunger Free America for inviting us to do this workshop. And Dan, who is an esteemed member of the advisory board for the Food in Prison Project to join as well and help moderate this conversation. So a brief, background, um, you heard our bio, so I'll move forward, um, about Impact Justice. It's a national research and innovation center that's focused on creating a more humane and restorative system of justice. So it's sort of an umbrella organization that has a number of projects underneath it, and those projects focus on three different areas. The first is reducing the number of people who come into contact with the justice system in the first place. The second is improving conditions for people who are currently incarcerated. And the third is supporting successful reentry for people who are coming out of prison. Um, as mentioned, one of those projects is the Food in Prison Project, uh, which is the first national effort to call attention to the crisis of prison food through exploring the impacts of the prison food experience on physical health, mental and emotional well being, and human dignity. We are framing a national dialogue and fostering collaboration to bring about comprehensive and transformative change to the food and the experience of food in America's prisons. And our biggest accomplishment to date is the recent publication of a report called Eating Behind Bars, Ending the Hidden Punishment of Food in Prison. You can find a copy of the report on our website, also in the Google Drive folder that Linnea shared a link to in the chat. And I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie to share some of the top takeaways um, from the investigation that we undertook. Thanks, Mika, and thank you, Dan and Brennan, as well. Uh, so yeah, our report is 130-something pages with details all about the state of food in prison, looking at different aspects of the prison food experience and prison food operations. Just to give you a few high-level takeaways, though, um, number one in the big picture, incarcerated people are routinely humiliated by the experience of eating in prison, and that has both immediate and long-term consequences. So we as humans use food to communicate identity, relationships, values, and the message that we're currently communicating to people who are incarcerated is that the people who are eating in is that they don't matter. You know, the food is really disgusting. It's a very, um, a very degrading and dehumanizing experience. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Sometimes the food is actually labeled not fit for human consumption. And being fed that kind of food day after day, year after year, has really serious impacts on people both in the long and short term. So immediate impacts, something as simple as people going hungry every single day, and longer term impacts, which we'll address in a few minutes on both physical and mental health. Uh, another high level takeaway is that the current standards for prison food are just unacceptably low. And that includes standards both in terms of what we culturally accept as being okay for prison food and also what's actually written into policy. And something that's really interesting that I think most people don't know is there is not actually any national standard for prison food or what kind of food can be served in prisons. Uh, the federal system has its own standards, different states all have their own standards local facilities, county level have their own standards. Um, and you know those are completely up to whatever that jurisdiction says. So some policies are very specific. you know there must be this many cups of vegetables, there must be you know this many fluid ounces of milk. and others are just you know the the meal should be nutritionally adequate and giving absolutely no definition as to what that is. Um, and again, you know, there's no national standard other than the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment, which is completely subjective. And so these really low standards sacrifice people's health in the favor of the lowest cost and the highest efficiency. So basically we've developed this system that incentivizes bad food and poor nutrition. And the last high level takeaway and accountability. There is a huge gap between policy and practice, between what's written and what actually happens day after day in facilities. 
And in many facilities, the already low standards aren't even being met in practice. So we need to figure out new ways to hold people accountable and new ways to ensure that what happens in terms of that what happens in terms of practice at least matches up to the policy. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how prison food is actually an issue of hunger. And Mika, if you can go to the next slide, thanks. So to start off, um, a little bit of the demographics of incarceration. Who is incarcerated? Who's locked up? And if you look at this particular graph from the Prison Policy Initiative, you can see who's infected, who's affected. And people of color are highly overrepresented in the carceral system. Um, Black Americans make up 13% of the US population, but over 40, about 40% 40 of the incarcerated population. So Black Americans are incarcerated at about five times the rate of white Americans. And Latino people are incarcerated at about three times the rate of white folks. And Native Americans are incarcerated at about twice the rate of white folks in this country. Uh, Mika, if you can switch the slide. Thanks. And you can see in this slide that the median annual income of incarcerated individuals is generally about half of that of the same age non-incarcerated individuals. And this graph from the Prison Policy Initiative is also race and gender. And so you can see that basically the folks who are incarcerated are generally from low-income communities and are generally from communities of color. And these are also the same communities that experience higher rates of food insecurity. And I'm going to turn it over to Mika to talk a little bit more um, about that. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. So um, even though incarcerated people are generally not included in conversations around food insecurity or food justice, what we found is that prisons often function as out of sight food deserts and sites of food apartheid. Um, so prison food environments share many of the same characteristics that we use to identify food deserts in the free world, namely a lack of access to healthy foods, an abundance of highly processed foods, a lack of choices, and negative health impacts. Um, we're going to go again into some more detail, but just to share a little bit about each of these factors um, in terms of lack of access to healthy options, the majority of, uh, so part of the investigation that underlied underlies our report is that we surveyed 250 formerly incarcerated people. We also did some in-depth interviewing. Um, so that's where these numbers are coming from. The majority of the folks that we surveyed rarely or never had access to fresh vegetables and only one in six um, had regular access to fresh fruit. Um, the meals that are served in prisons tend to rely heavily on refined carbs to kind of fill out the necessary calorie count. And we'll talk about commissaries, which is another way that people can get access to food in prison. Those tend to be stocked with really processed foods that are laden with sodium and sugar. Um, lack of choices is maybe the clearest, uh, um, I guess, systematic factor in prisons, right? On the day-to-day -day incarcerated people don't have a choice in what meals they're served. And there's generally one choice in terms of the mainline meal. Um, and we did survey state correctional departments as well. Very few of them actively um, create mechanisms for incarcerated people to participate in that menu development. Um, and then finally, negative health impacts. There's Bureau, Bureau of Justice Statistics data that shows that incarcerated people have higher rates of diet related chronic diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, Leslie's going to share a little bit more about some of the other impacts in a moment here. Um, and before I turn it back to her, I just want to highlight that um, the issue is not just that the food that is accessible is unhealthy and low quality. There's also persistent issues with hunger and people actually getting enough food to eat. And I'm going to turn it back to Leslie to share more about that. Thanks, Mika. So on this next slide, you can see some actual photographs of prison meals. Um, the first in the upper left hand corner is a recent meal that was taken uh, with a contraband cell phone camera in an Oklahoma prison. The one to the right of that is a tray from a South Carolina facility in 2016. Underneath that you have a picture of Nutriloaf, which is a mush of old leftover bits of food that is often served to people who are in solitary confinement. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, 
you have a picture of a meal that was served several months ago during the COVID crisis to people in a state prison in Texas. So this is just to help you get a sense of what the food looks like, um, what the portion size is like in typical prison facilities. So as you can see in terms of quantity, uh, many people that we surveyed and interviewed described the portion size as more appropriate for elementary school kids than for grown adults. And folks who are incarcerated don't really have any control over the portions. Um, they're not necessarily allowed to get up and get second helpings. So really what you see on the tray is what you get for your meals. This is generally not enough food for people. Uh, and this is especially challenging for people with special diets. It's a very long and complicated bureaucratic process to get a special diet if you have religious food needs or food allergies or other type of medical needs. Um, so, you know, there, you might not necessarily even be able to access a special diet tray. And we've heard from several people that, you know, they weren't actually given a special diet tray, but rather uh, told to just manage their eating based on what they're actually served. So, so for example, we heard from diabetics who were told, oh, just eat around the white bread, eat around the white rice, because that's what you'd have to do outside in the real world. Uh, we heard a, a story from someone who spent over a year and a half eating beans, even though he was allergic to them, um, because the prison was, you know, not wanting to give him a bean free tray. And at the same time, he wasn't receiving enough other food to actually not go hungry. So he would eat the beans and then suffer severe gastrointestinal distress from that because he was allergic to them. So, you know, in terms of the portion size, there's just generally not enough food. In terms of whether the food is actually edible, the quality tends to range from kind of bland and unappealing to food that is literally inedible or unsafe. Um, people who are incarcerated experience foodborne illnesses at six times the rate of people on the outside. And 84% of the people we surveyed told us that the food rarely or never tasted good. People told us in our surveys and interviews about things like weevils in the grits, rocks in greens, meat that had maggots in it, finding a rat tail in food. Um, oatmeal was a common theme. We heard people talk about oatmeal that was uh, full of human hair or people found pieces of metal or pieces of cockroaches in their oatmeal. Uh, three out of four of our survey respondents reported being served food that was spoiled or rotten, like moldy bread, sour meat, um, slugged salad mix, or canned um, or pa packaged products that were years past their expiration date, which people who are working in the kitchens actually notice. We heard from someone that um, sometimes they would actually get served chocolate milk, but only when the milk had already spoiled. And so when you got chocolate milk, you would know that it was going to actually be chunky. And the food is actually even worse in terms of both quality and quantity for people who are in solitary confinement. So again, people might be served Nutri-Loaf a couple times a day for a week or two at a time. That's just, again, a slice of this mash of things, like it could be mashed up bread, meat, oatmeal, leftover vegetables, um, just all baked and sliced up. And that's, that's your meal. And people you know, don't necessarily have access to anything else. And we heard from folks who'd been in solitary confinement that people were actually eating toothpaste and toilet paper just to have something in their stomach. So as Nika mentioned before, uh, people talked about widespread hunger when they were incarcerated. 94% of our survey respondents told us they couldn't get enough food to feel full while they were incarcerated. And 71% told us that they had to do things that were against policy or rules to be able to get access to more food. So even when there is food there that's edible and people are able to eat it, um, that food is high in refined carbohydrates, high in sodium and sugar, very low in essential nutrients. And basically people in prison are being served a diet which the rest of us have been advised for decades to avoid. Uh, as Mika mentioned before, a large number of our survey respondents reported lack of regular access to fresh fruits and vegetables. That's over 80%. And many facilities rely on a fortified beverage mix, which is basically like a Kool-Aid that's fortified with vitamins and minerals. Um, but people are worried about the dyes and the sugar in those products and refuse to drink them because they say they taste so much like chemicals. Many people talked about preferring to use them as hair dye rather than actually drink them. So people aren't necessarily getting those nutrients that their bodies need. And this can result in both long and short-term physical impacts. And you can see some of these on the slide that we have up now. This slide is also in section two of our report if you'd like to take a longer look at it later. 
Um, but you can see, you know, every part of the body is affected from, um, you know, things like gastrointestinal reflux and diabetes to immune systems being suppressed because of lack of critical nutrients. Um, you know, we heard from people whose bones and teeth are fragile, from people who aren't healing well. And all of these things start, you know, simple and the short-term impacts, people are hungry all the time. I don't know how many of you have experienced hunger, but that, that horrible feeling of you get so hungry that you get really irritable and angry, but imagine feeling like that all the time. And as people are served this kind of food over months and years, um, it can also cause brain fog and depression. Lack of critical nutrients can actually lead to aggressive and antisocial behavior. So that's actually making facilities less safe. Um, there's, you know, there are just so many impacts that people carry with them. And it's basically an extended punishment that people continue to carry with them after they finish their prison sentence. And something else to note is that um, there are high levels of people who are incarcerated who have experienced trauma and people who also uh, experience substance use disorder. I think the statistic is that 85% of people who are incarcerated um, suffer from substance use disorder. And both trauma and substance use can actually impact the way that our bodies absorb food and process food, which affects our physiology, which in turn affects our mental state and our well being, which can lead to people um, making not as great choices in their life, which again, you know, can lead to either reincarceration um, or perpetuate patterns of trauma and substance use in families or in communities. So this is really a cycle and it's something that can actually be interrupted by better food, but unfortunately that's just not happening at this time. So I've shown a little bit about the meals that are served in prisons and now Mika is going to talk a little bit about the commissary, which is the other way that people who are incarcerated are able to access food. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. Um, it's always horrifying to see the photos as many times as I've seen them before and think about having that tray of food put in front of me and being expected to eat it. Um, so like Leslie just mentioned, there are other ways that people have access to food and a widely shared sentiment that came out in our investigation, I think is summed up pretty well in this quote, which was shared in a survey by a loved one of someone who's incarcerated, which is, when they feed them, it's not food. If they don't have family paying for canteen, I don't see how they survive. So there is um, sanctioned access to other food through uh, generally what's called a commissary or canteen. It's sort of a mini store that people can order from and uh, the prison sells hygiene essentials and food items um, through the canteen. Because of how terrible the mainline meals are, almost 90% of the people that we surveyed said that they would prefer to eat food from commissary given the option. Um, but there are some limitations there, of course. Uh, the only food that's sold is, are items that are non-perishable. So that generally means that the vast majority of items are highly processed. They're high in salt and sugar. Um, it's, not, it's generally not healthy food that you have access to purchase there. Um, and even then, these items are not accessible to everyone. So only two in five of the people we surveyed said they could actually afford commissary purchases, uh, which is not really surprising um, if, you're, if you weren't aware that um, wages for prison work often amounts to just cents per hour. The national um, average hourly rate is less than 50 cents an hour. Um, so this graphic, I'm not going to talk through each example, but basically shows how many hours someone would have to work in a, a selection of a few different states in order to afford items that are pulled from commissary lists in those states. So just to give one example, in order to afford an eight ounce uh, Folgers instant coffee in Minnesota, you would have to work for eight hours to earn the pay. And like the quote mentioned, people can receive support from outside family, but again, many of the folks who are incarcerated um, are coming from lower income families and communities and uh, their family may not have the means to support them um, in terms of purchasing other food. Um, and I just wanted to know as well, I think it's relevant in our context and also in you know, the context of Martin Luther King Jr. Day that um, the reason that people can be paid so little is because the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, made an exception for people who are convicted of a crime. And in at least seven states, incarcerated people actually work for no wages at all. Um, 
And this is a really important both food justice issue and labor rights and labor justice issue. I'm gonna turn it back over to Leslie. Thanks, Mika. So just to point out, there is a ripple effect here because people who are incarcerated are not the only ones impacted by the prison food. Um, it actually impacts people's families, it impacts communities, and it impacts our entire society. So just to share a couple of statistics so you can get a sense of the scope of the problem, there are about 2.3 million people currently incarcerated in the United States. There are about 4.9 million people who are not currently incarcerated, but have spent time in a state or federal prison. There are 77 million people with a criminal record, which includes people who spent time in prisons and also people who might have spent some time in jails. There are 5.7 million kids under the age of 18 who have experienced the incarceration of a parent. adult Americans has an immediate family member who has been in prison or jail. So that means that even if you personally have not experienced having a family member who's been in prison or jail, you probably know someone who does. And there's a serious lack of support for returning citizens um, for, you know, making sure that they are provided for in terms of access to food. So people who are coming out of prison, especially if they've been in for a while, don't necessarily have money to afford healthy food. They don't necessarily have a place to store it or cook it. Many of the people who have spent long periods of time in prison are also challenged by take for granted, like how to shop for food on a budget or how to prepare simple and healthy meals. And as I'm sure many of you on this call know, um, an insufficient lack of food or insufficiently healthy food really affects physical and mental health, which in turn impacts people's ability to hold a job, to be a good parent, to be a good partner, um, to contribute to one's family and community in a positive way. And because so many people experience an actual lack of food or lack of nutritious food, that can create conditions under which people take desperate measures to feed themselves and their families, which can lead people to engage in behaviors that can lead to re-arrest. So bad food actually probably helps contribute to higher way to avoid this is to increase both government food assistance. So for example, in many states, people with certain kinds of convictions, criminal convictions, don't have access to SNAP benefits. And in some places, those can be taken away for life. So if people aren't able to get assistance in order to get food, um, you know, that's actually a problem that can affect their families. There are children who might not be able to get access to food because their parents have been incarcerated and have certain types of criminal convictions. Um, so increasing both government food assistance, making sure that SNAP is available to all regardless of record, increasing food assistance specifically for folks who have been incarcerated, as well as individual programs that focus on food as part of support. So for example, there's an organization called Dismas House, which operates in Vermont and in several other states. And in their houses in Vermont, they bring folks who are leaving prison to live in a house with people who have not been incarcerated, so often college students or other people from the community who are looking for housing for a period of time. And part of their program is that they cook meals together, or sometimes a local chef will come in and cook a meal for everyone and everyone will eat together, or they'll invite people in from the community to come and eat with them and have discussions over meals. And it's really an important part of encouraging people to get involved in the community, to establish stronger relationships. And programs like that can promote better physical and mental health. And when people are well fed with food that is not just nourishing to the body, but also to the soul, that actually can lead to safer communities and can also have economic benefits. So when people aren't experiencing as many health problems, we spend less on health care, both in terms of our individual selves and in terms society. And Mika, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you. So um, turning to our last section here, what would a vision of better prison food look like? Um, Impact Justice as an organization believes that achieving justice in a broader sense has to involve drastically reducing the number of people we lock up. Um, but we also believe in improving the material conditions for the millions of people who are incarcerated today and that no person's health or diet should be determined by their social position. Um, justice is not just about an outcome, but a process. 
So, you know, we don't want to just dictate what we think prison food should look like. Um, we want to actually listen to and support what the people who are eating the food actually want. What we heard in our investigation through our surveys and interviews was pretty clear. Right now, what people who are incarcerated want is more fruits and vegetables, more protein, fewer carbs, and higher quality products all around, obviously food that's safe to eat. Um, but I think it's important to state too that food justice in this case won't just look like a better tray, um, but actually a process that gives more power and self-determination to incarcerated people. And as you can see, prison food sits at the center of several intersecting There are lots of people working on justice reform issues right now, things like ending solitary confinement, um, promoting better health care for incarcerated people, um, helping decrease the cost for communications for telephone calls and emails to loved ones. And food is actually interwoven with all of those issues. So for example, people in solitary confinement, as we mentioned, often experience less food and worse food than people in the general population. Um, you know, in terms of health care, obviously bad food leads to increased health issues, which requires more health care and um, more food actually be used to assist with some other things like communication with loved ones. You know, why can't people, uh, when their loved ones come for visitation, why can't they sit down to a good meal with their family and friends? Typically what's available for people during visitation is, you know, a vending machine that might have soda or candy bars. Um, but as we all know, you know, meal family meals are really important for building and sustaining relationships. So um, it's certainly connected to criminal justice reform. Labor rights issues, Mika also mentioned, incarcerated people are working in kitchens and farms for minimal or no wages. This is an issue of environmental sustainability. A lot of the food arrives pre-prepared at prisons. It's an immense amount of packaging. Things are being trucked across the country that don't necessarily need to be. And there's a ton of food waste on site because people aren't always eating the food because it's simply too disgusting to eat. Um, it's obviously an issue of racial justice, as we mentioned in terms of the demographics of who's affected by this issue. And it really is a part of the food justice movement in general. So this echoes issues on the outside, like accessibility, you know, both in terms of what food is available to people and whether or not it's affordable. I noticed someone in the chat just mentioned that the commissary is ex indeed extremely expensive and it's difficult to support family members um, with money for a commissary. Uh, food in prisons is also not necessarily culturally relevant, which is important in helping people establish a healthy relationship with food. It helps in healing people who are in difficult situations. And really it's an issue of food sovereignty. And I would say one of the biggest ones, you know, people have absolutely no control over the food that is available to them or the food, the way the prison food system works. And so restoring a sense of control and empowerment to people who are incarcerated um, can you know, only lead to better food and better outcomes. You know, just as food is a tool on the outside for healing oneself both physically and mentally and emotionally um, and helping strengthen relationships and increase skills that could potentially help people get a job and increase a sense of belonging and connection to different communities, whether that's a geographic community. Um, you know, these are all issues of food justice that are just simply echoed on the inside for people who are incarcerated. And now I'll turn it over to Mika to talk a little bit about some action steps that people can take to address this issue. Great. And we are, um, this is the last slide in our presentation. So start thinking about questions that you may have while I go through this. Um, all right, so this is a huge systemic issue that affects millions of people and involves, um, you know, dozens of jurisdictions, if not hundreds across the country. What steps can each of us as individuals take? It feels a little bit daunting. Um, to get us started, we have a few ideas. So one is to learn more. This presentation just scraped the surface. Um, our report and other resources uh, and stories from, you know, even folks in the chat who are sharing those, right, have much more comprehensive detail about the nuances of this issue. 
one of the things that we heard several times during our interviews was that it really mattered to people who have experienced incarceration that someone cared enough to listen. Um, you know, it's important to bear witness to the details that different people experience and uh, to learn more about the issue that way. Um, secondly, you can bring prison food into your existing food justice platforms. Um, some of you may already be involved with campaigns and uh, there could be a way to work in prison food uh, to a platform for change that already exists. If you have ideas about that, connected to that, that you'd like to pursue and wanna to talk to us about, definitely reach out. Um, and then third, you can get plugged in with local efforts. So look locally to where you live. Are there opportunities to shed light on conditions in the prisons near you specifically? Um, are there local efforts that are underway to try to get you know, people released from prison, reduce the incarceration rates, or improve conditions for folks who are inside? I think it's easy to become overwhelmed by the magnitude of the problem, but a good way to um, combat that is to find people who are already doing this work because there are people already doing this work and join them. All right, um, you'll have access to these slides which have Leslie and I's information and um, I'm gonna turn it back to Dan before we open it up more broadly for questions. Yes, um, yeah, so just briefly, I mean, Again, I, I kind of put myself in the shoes of all of you who are listening to this, if this is new information, clearly there's a lot of people who are on watching today that are familiar with this space um, for a variety of reasons. But if, if you weren't before, it is alarming. I, again, uh, as someone who has transitioned my career to be a chef in institutions, and some of you alluded to the fact that uh, it is similar to uh, kind of a system in schools, but Shockingly, you know, when we got into schools, it's it's so limiting working in schools, and um, this is like on a whole whole another level. Uh, I mean, it's it's not even comparable. Uh, just to put it into perspective, in schools this year we have three dollars and fifty cents um, for lunch, and that's for food, that's for labor, that's for everything involved in producing that meal, which usually comes down to about a dollar twenty-five for food, and that's nothing. Um, and we're seeing that in prisons, you know, some of these prisons are spending 50 cents for a meal. Um, so it, it's, it's unbelievable, to be honest. And, and just before we get into questions, again, please ask questions. We have a few, I have a few questions that I'm going to ask Mika and Leslie, but if you have questions for us, get them in here now. But before we go to that, I just wanted to say, you know, what we're trying to do, Brigade as a company, is I'm determined, I want us to get into this space. Uh, there are people working in this space. Um, we take it from a different perspective. I mean, we're not an advocacy group. That's not what we are. We're chefs. Um, I'm a firm believer that everybody deserves food prepared with thought. And unfortunately, whether it's in a school or whether it's in a prison or a hospital or a senior center, um, there's a lot of folks out there who know how to cook and they're usually not putting their effort into those places. That's what we do. Uh, and we're determined to get into prisons. There are people working in prisons already, obviously trying to do their best in certain areas and different parts of the country, but it's really difficult. And um, at the very least, I would like to think that we could use our platform to get more chefs interested in the prospect of working in a prison and what that means. Um, at least people... <laughs> because, um, you know, the fact of the matter is that's what we need to figure out. What is possible to actually achieve in a prison? And I think the first step for that is creating a standard. Um, it's the one thing that sticks out for me when I read this report, there's a lot of alarming things, uh, but to think that there is not a federal standard and that people are left to make these decisions at local levels and state levels is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, because as again, as someone who works in school food, there is a standard and it's still ridiculously hard and that standard still allows quality to be terrible. So to think that there's no standard at all um, it's no surprise that, that things are being served that are being served. So I don't know, just some food for thought and perspective from, from someone who's working in a school. Um, this is just on a different, just a completely different level, uh, to, to many extents. So, um, I'm going to ask a couple questions to Mika and Leslie, and then we will take some of these questions that are coming in, in the chat. So in a very current way, how has the, um, the, the current situation, the pandemic affected uh, food in prisons? So unfortunately, the pandemic has actually taken a bad situation and made it even worse. 
In many prisons, meals have been reduced to two times a day. Um, many prisons are no longer serving hot meals. People are getting a, a brown bag of something that is delivered to their cell. Um, you know, people are at, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were people still being shoved into crowded chow halls all together without any distancing. And people who were experiencing COVID, system, COVID symptoms were asked to continue working in the kitchen. Um, you know, and uh, as as the pandemic has gotten worse, there are many facilities that have gone on lockdown. So then people were locked all the time into their cells and didn't even have access to the chow hall in a distanced way so that people weren't getting any type of social interaction or their hot meals. Um, because a lot of facility staff and a people who work in the kitchens have fallen ill with COVID. There are people with significantly less experience with food preparation now making meals, so the meals are even less edible. Um, a lot of facilities are no longer respecting special diets for religious or medical issues, so people aren't necessarily getting the food that they need. And people are getting a lot more junk too. Um, so yeah, I mean, the quality really has just gone down. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, there is one facility in Maine that we were actually able to visit, which has a wonderful food service manager. And he actually, during the pandemic, initially reached out to local farms and producers who would normally be selling their food to restaurants and schools and, um, and asked if they could come to some sort of special deal to get that food into prisons so that the food didn't go to waste and so that he could actually continue to serve better meals to keep people's spirits up. So, you know, on the one hand, we're seeing like that photo in the slide from the Texas prison, which was showing like this is a typical meal during COVID versus people actually getting that incorporates quality proteins and vegetables, which again is it's possible to do it just takes more work. Um, yeah, so COVID in general has had a pretty negative impact on an already bad situation. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. Um, this next question, I think, is, is super important for, I mean, to be completely honest with you, as, as, a, as a group who's, who would like to work in prisons, and similarly, when we go into schools, you have to unfortunately justify why this is important, why this work is important outside of the obvious fact that people should be treated properly. Um, but this question, the idea of, um, obvious, it's obvious to us, people who do see food as a human right want better food in prisons, but what's the argument that prisons should actually want better food too? And I think that's such an important argument and have an answer to in, in the effort to actually getting into these places to, 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 to make the work happen. Yeah, I can take that one, Dan. I think it's important to share up front that, um, both in sort of the local sense and the national sense, the way that decisions and power in the system um, are distributed is not concentrated. There's not one person who has the power to say, okay, I'm going to change prison food for the better. Um, so I will acquire the resources needed to do that. I'll hire, you know, chefs who will properly train, you know, take all the steps needed. There, of course, is um, a fair amount that is under the purview of the you know, individual food service manager at an individual facility, um, but they don't get to decide what their budget is. They don't get to decide how many people are incarcerated in the facility that they need to feed. So there are all these interplaying factors. And then you layer on top of that, the fact that um, there are so many different jurisdictions, right? Um, like Dan and Leslie have both talked about, there's not only are there no federal guidelines, but um, there's very little federal oversight and the, the jurisdiction is just is separate. States have the power to determine what happens in correctional facilities in their um, particular geographic area. So um, just to complicate the picture even further before I really answer the question, um, the, the thing that we consistently hear from folks who work in corrections is that the number one consideration is safety and security. And we did hear from corrections officers who make that connection, right? The culture in a facility is going to be better and safer if people are not hungry, if people are satisfied. Um, but like Leslie said early on, the standard of acceptability is so low. And we think that um, the quality of food, even as it is now, is a, is a very significant safety and security issue and that that framing could potentially help get some other folks on board. And just to point to some of the pieces that Leslie already shared earlier, right? Um, there are ties between uh, 
critical nutrient deficiencies and aggression. That's a clear safety issue in prison. Um, about two thirds of the respondents to our survey said that they had to do things that were against the policy or rules to either get access to more food or better quality food. That's a clear security issue. Um, and of course it can be really serious. You know, we heard stories about corrections officers who exploit their power to sexually abuse incarcerated people um, in exchange for bringing them additional food from the outside. Um, so that, that would be on the far end, an example of how this deprivation, people really needing good food can lead to serious safety concerns in prison. All just very alarming. Um, and, then, and then one final question here, and this is, this is a big one. And I think this was actually asked in the chat as well before we go to some questions from the chat, because this is a very polarizing topic, unfortunately. I know personally on like our social media in the majority of our work again has been done in schools and when we talk about the work we're doing in schools everyone's a big fan of that um, it's clear when we talk about the potential of us working in, in prisons to improve the food um, there's a lot of people who don't really understand um, the importance of that or don't care quite frankly um, it, it's there's no question so um, when hunger is such a prevalent issue in the free world, why should people care about what incarcerated people have to eat? So I would argue um, to start with, people who are incarcerated are people. They are people's parents and siblings and partners and other loved ones. And people deserve good food as a human right. Um, it's, it's really that simple. And again, for all of the reasons that we've discussed in this presentation and that we discuss in more detail in our report, it really does impact us all. It impacts families, communities, our entire society when people who are incarcerated are not getting appropriate food. Um, you know, this is, this is really a bigger issue. And I think, you know, one, one way that I, that I think is helpful to think about it is to, to really take a moment and reflect on the role of food in your own life and think about how you feel when you've eaten a meal that is really satisfying because it fills you up and it tastes good and it's healthy. And to think about, you know, on the flip side, how do you feel when you're hungry, when you haven't had food in a really long time? Or how do you feel when you have to eat a meal that's disgusting or when you have to eat in a stressful environment? How does that make your body feel? How does that make your mind feel? What does it do to your emotions? Um, you know, how does food connect you to important people in your life or important memories or important geographical spaces or communities. You know, we, food is something we all experience on a deeply biological and cultural level. And I think when you ask people to stop and think about the role of food in their own lives, you know, none of that changes just because someone is incarcerated. You know, people still connect with food in the same way. Mika, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I just, I want to add one piece because I think um, there's this sort of logical line that people take, right? Well, people are in prison because they did something bad. They need to be punished. And if they're punished, that's going to deter other people from committing crimes. And we use that to justify terrible conditions in prisons. But the research doesn't pan out. There's been a lot of research actually on deterrence studies and um, more severe punishments don't lead to decreases in crime. So if you throw out that premise and say, okay, what we all care about is communities that are healthy and that are safe, what actually contributes to safety? Um, Certainly it's not putting people in positions, you know, as we've talked about over the course of this presentation where um, they are deficient in critical uh, nutrients, they're in a worse place, worst, worst place in terms of their physical and mental health. Um, we wanna promote healing and safety and food can actually be a tool for that. One of the um, things that Mark McBride, who's the food service manager at, at Mountain View Correctional Center that Leslie mentioned in Maine that we like, is food can be medicine or it can be poison. And I think that that applies in a broader sense to just our own physical bodies, but also our society as well. Yeah, and, and just kind of a closing note before we get into the chat questions is just, I, I, I like to use the word thoughtful in reference to food, you know, because we usually typically talk about, oh, it's delicious or this, it looks a certain way, but it's just thoughtfulness. It's just, you know, regardless of what your budget is and what you're working with, it's just genuinely trying to do the best you can with what you have. You know, when we talk about reform in these places, it's not like the budget's gonna, even if there was a standard, there's not, it's not gonna go through the roof. It's not like there's gonna be $7 a meal. It's still gonna be tough. But 
it's just the idea behind doing absolutely everything you can to make it as best as you can with what you have. And it will still probably be very basic. Um, and with that said, there's no question that people see that and they feel that the people who are receiving that food understand that thought is being put into it, efforts being put into it. And I think that's kind of the whole point of what we're talking about here. When you feed people, um, food can be delicious and to you, and it might not be delicious to the other person, but I think objectively people can see when effort is being put into something. And I think that's the most important thing in the end. And that's, what's really not even close to happening in these settings. So, 